All right. So this is my ultimate favorite presentation to actually do because it has a lot of personal and professional happiness and, and some not so happiness attached to it. But it really goes to speak to what I was talking about during the first presentation about the whole HRRP. Why is it important? And at the, at the core of it, we really have to do a better job of activating and engaging our patients. And this is what this project really speaks to. <clears throat> so um, again, no conflicts of interest. I'll, all the material is either my opinion or cited to source or authority. And anything that's in here is just for the purpose of example and is not a recommendation nor endorsement. Your Learner outcomes, you're going to evaluate the needs assessment completed to identify the gaps in our patient education from the patient's perspective. Identify the link between health literacy, health confidence, and preventing readmissions. We're going to describe the journey to developing this program, the roles, the functions of all the team members that were involved, and the interactive patient education experience. And understand the concepts of health literacy and health confidence in respect to the CCMC Code of Professional Conduct. So yes, this does count as ethics, guys. Yay! Um, I want to preface this by saying that this present or this program was conceived, initiated, and implemented pre-COVID. So there's some things that probably need to be changed if we're going to Im implement, re-implement it post-COVID but there's also some value in, in being in person as well. All right, so we all know about our potentially preventable readmissions have been linked to insufficient or ineffective discharge opportunities. We know that case managers have long made the connection between social determinants of healthcare and the increased risk for readmission through the stories that we tell each other on a daily basis. The stories, in books like this that CMSA Chicago puts out, that I'm going to start off you know, by reading a story out of this actually, <clears throat> a little bit further into this. We also know that failure to create overarching strategies to address the gaps that are caused by social determinants of health continues to impact the care continuum's ability to adequately take care of that patient and make sure that they're successful post-discharge. All right. Just a quick refresher, not that it's not fresh in your brains from the last time, but one out of five Medicare patients readmitted within 30 days, 34% within 90 days, and 50.2% or now down to 48% do not have a PCP visit within that immediate 30-day post-hospitalization period. <clears throat> so here's our case study number one. James is a 68-year-old guy, lives at home with his wife, Martha, for, you know, they've been married for 48 years. James is admitted to the hospital with shortness of breath, diagnosed with pneumonia and an underlying new onset of heart failure. James and Martha are provided with instructions about his new medications and his diet before discharged, and they're asked to see his physician in the office in the next two weeks. Aunt, wrong answer. Seven days, gold standard, right? A few days after returning home, Martha reminds James to schedule his visit in the physician's office but James has difficulty reaching the scheduler. How many of us have tried scheduling our own appointments only to have all the troubles in the world? You get stuck in that loop of the phone or you get a, get a hold of somebody and they don't understand that you've just been in the hospital and need to see that, that doctor or the patient doesn't have the words to be able to just to say that. They just say, I need an appointment. So James is set up with a visit three weeks later. <coughs> Excuse me way outside of that gold standard. James also doesn't mention to Martha that he took the three-day supply of Lasix at the hospital sent home with him, but he never filled the prescription because, hey, I felt good and you know, really thought that that expense was unnecessary. But when he noticed that his legs were starting to swell up again, he didn't want to bother the busy doctor when, in fact, he did not want to go through the ordeal of calling the office again. So after 11 days, James is readmitted to the hospital with an increased shortness of breath Market marked edema of his lower legs, a weight gain of 25 pounds, and mildly elevated BNP. The hospital stay went well. James' stress level is high. His blood pressure is elevated. So we're going to put another drug on his medication regimen for his high blood pressure now. While James is in the hospital, Martha is admitted for emergency surgery. After discharge, James is eating in fast food restaurants because he's worried about his wife juggling visits to her bedside and managing a roofing project on their home. 
The day Martha comes home from the hospital, James is readmitted for another exacerbation of heart failure. So we all know from our readmissions presentation that we get paid for the first one. We don't get paid for the second one. We don't get paid for the third one. And that's going to be taken into account at the end of the year when they look at how many readmissions you had. On top of the fact that James is just not really engaged. He took the three-day supply of Lasix, didn't fill the prescription because, hey, you know what? I felt good. Nobody really probably explained to him that he needs to take the Lasix every day because he's got a chronic condition that he needs to manage. And, you know, the expense is unnecessary. Is there an, is there an alternative diuretic that they could put him on that's a less lower cost? So, again, a failure to create overarching strategies to address the gaps that James and other people in this presentation <clears throat> um, will see continues to impact our care continuum's ability to take care of our patients and set them up for success. We need to address our patients' health literacy and health confidence, two different things. As much, it, this, is, this is as much of a necessity as identifying whether or not a patient needs to go to a skilled nursing facility or needs to get home health care agency services or needs DME or, you know, making sure that they have, you know, a, a post a hospitalization visit set up. This is all important stuff. Okay. Addressing patient health literacy and health confidence is the key for us though to creating that patient engagement and that patient activation. And it also helps us provide excellent patient-centered care, promotes client self-advocacy and independence, which is all part of our CCMC uh, Code of Professional Conduct and the CMSA Standards of Practice. So what's best for the patient? He wants to stay home. He wants to you know, be in his environment. How do we help solve the gaps in care? Well, we didn't educate him about how important it is to take his medication. Did we make the medication accessible for him? Not just <clears throat> giving him three days supply, but there's a lot of facilities that do what they call a meds to beds, 30 days supply delivered to the bedside before the patient gets discharged. How much is that medication? Is there a lower cost alternative? Making sure that we solve those gaps in care. Making sure that we treat our patients with respect and inherent dignity Patients who have social determinants of health deficits are no different than any other patient that we have. Everyone deserves the same level of care across the board. And principle number three says that we will maintain objectivity with our relationships with our clients. It is not appropriate for us to pass judgment or say, you know what, they made a bad decision, they're accountable for it. Now, we all know that our patients have rights to make bad decisions, but we're always going to be there to make sure that we can help them pick up the pieces and go forward from there. You're not going to go, I told you this was going to happen as much as we want to. All right. Case study number two, social determinants of health and health literacy. <clears throat> okay. So this is actually a, a patient that was uh, a patient story that was published in the first edition of the CMSA Chicago book. And it's a great story. It's one of my favorites because it really does, uh, describe the differences between what happens if you do something and what happens if you don't do something. So William came to our hospital with an infected wound on his foot, but in truth, his troubles were greater than what was presented. When I first met William, not me, the writer, he was an affable but guarded patient, willing to answer questions, but only to a certain point. And then, then he started to be evasive. The next time I went to speak with him, he was in full-blown withdrawal from his heroin addiction. And during his admission, his discharge concerns continued to mount. <clears throat> he was homeless, uninsured, without an income, without family or other social supports, and without a primary care physician. All of these issues making it difficult for him to obtain the medical care that he needed to heal his infected foot. He needed antibiotics, a substance abuse program, a clean place to change his dressings, follow up at a wound care clinic, a primary care physician, and transportation to all of his appointments. So let's take a look at William here. What are our issues? Our issues are He's undomiciled, he's uninsured, he has no income, no connections, no social supports, no primary care physician, <clears throat> okay? And that's just the beginning of it, right? He also has substance use disorder, <clears throat> which will make all of these things more, much more difficult because if we're, if we're thinking, let's go and get him easy enough, we can apply for Medicaid for him. 
he probably would would qualify for Medicaid here in Illinois. But now that he's got Medicaid, we can get him into a skilled nursing facility. But a skilled nursing facility may or may not take him dependent on his current substance use disorder patterns and the other issues that he may may have for, for wound care, depending on how you know severe the wound care is going to be. So now we're going to prioritize those issues. Well, you know what? There's a couple of things in here that we can really take care of quickly. Getting him the Medicaid coverage, a no-brainer. We, we send that off to our FCMU. <clears throat> Homeless, plenty of shelters. We've got a great shelter system here in Chicago. The income, not a lot we could do about that, but we will help and we'll work. We'll refer him to some community um, organizations that can help him find uh, a position or any kind of temporary support. Uh, family and other social supports, that was a tenuous one. That was going to be a long-term project. Primary care physician was going to be easy enough because we, we had primary care physicians that were willing to step up and, and take care of the patient. All right. So after meeting with William a few times, and I apologize for the small print here, um, he was agreeable to try a Suboxone program for his heroin use issues. And one of the hospital's affiliated clinics had such a program and could enroll him in it. His hospital physician was also on staff at the same clinic and was willing to continue to see William as an outpatient, even with his current financial status awaiting Medicaid uh, approval. Financial counselors were contacted and they with William began his application for Medicaid. We were also able to find him temporary transitional shelter at a facility that worked with the homeless for needed medical care. William now had a place to live for a while where he could care for his foot in a clean environment. A call to our wound care clinic was made, and after some advocating, they were willing to see William, knowing that his insurance had not yet been approved, and they would monitor the healing of his foot ulcer. The hospital's medication program was able to provide him with his antibiotics. The nursing floor at discharge provided him with extra dressing changes until he could go to the wound care clinic, and the hospital provided bus passes for William to get to all of his appointments. I met with William two to three times a week to check in with him and provide him the needed bus passes. <clears throat> About four weeks into the situation, I saw William and he stated he was doing well. He was still attending the substance abuse program and had remained abstinent. He was continuing with the wound care clinic and his foot was doing much better well on the way to being healed. I offered him some more bus passes for transportation and he declined, stating he didn't need them. Well, I asked, <clears throat> how was he going to get to his appointments? He smiled at me and stated, I got a job. He had started a new job the previous week and was getting his first paycheck that day. He was grateful for all the work that we had done, but did not want to continue to take what he didn't need. He gave me a huge hug and went off to work. She says, I heard from William three months later, still substance free. The wound was healed and he was still working. He had found an apartment and was also making headway with rebuilding his personal relationships. Addressing the social determinants of health helped this guy get on the road, not only to physical healing, but to all sorts of other kinds of healing as well. All right, so <clears throat> I tell you these things because there was a project that we worked on. We worked on readmissions like every other hospital. And then one day I was like, we're throwing everything and the kitchen sink at, at this problem. And we're not seeing any really measurable decreases, any great wins. Um, and, and, I, and I realized that we'd left one person out of this whole thing. This, is, this whole readmissions reduction project was lacking the most important person's perspective, and that's the patient. So I did a literature search, <clears throat> because of course I did, looking for studies that address the patient's perspective or the patient's point of view in reducing readmissions, maybe risk surveys about you know, their social determinants of health needs, et cetera, et cetera. There was absolutely nothing out there. I found one, um, one article done several years ago from uh, the social work perspective in the community that had nothing really to do with <clears throat> readmission reduction, but a lot to do with doing a social determinants of health assessment, which I thought was very, very cool. And, and it really helped build this project. So what we did is we took a page out of the outpatient world using the prepare survey, which is about three pages long. And we identified about 10 of the questions out of that prepare survey. And so it could be administered either by the case manager nurse or the case management social worker to identify gaps in self-management for our patients. So 
linking resources to community. And we were using that data that the original thought about this was we're going to use this information to build out a resource library for our population. Okay, our population needs to know about X, Y, Z, and Q. Okay, great. But as we continued on doing these surveys of our readmitted patients, we discovered something really interesting and incredibly poignant as well. <clears throat> so um, we conducted the survey from July through February. Uh, we had 120 readmitted patients, 118 of them were unplanned. So we had a pretty decent sample size. And after month three, we started including what we called, the, what, what, what is called the health confidence survey developed by yet another one of my my uh, pantheon of readmission rock stars, my fangirl moments, Dr. Eric Coleman and uh, his partner. So health confidence survey is basically a survey that says, how confident are you that you can take care of yourself at home? One simple question and one simple question that nobody had been asking, right? So we started adding that in. So when we started looking at the results of all this information as we went along, um, almost 100% of our patients had access to their medications within 24 hours. They had insurance coverage, 100% of them. They had insurance coverage for their medication, absolutely. Could they get to the pharmacy within 24 hours? A little less than, than 100%. Um, when we asked them, did you call your doctor before you came to the hospital for your readmission? Almost 80% of them said they had not. Over 75% of them had not had a follow-up appointment made for them before they left the hospital. And over 40% of them did not keep that appointment. So <clears throat> we took a look at these and said, hey, you know what? Some social determinants of health issues that everybody thought was gonna be the biggies, like, oh, they don't have access to their medication. So let's put a meds to bed program in place. Oh, they don't have access to insurance. So let's do this, this, and this. Let's increase our charity care they had very little impact on our readmitted population. What they did tell us was that they were receiving their discharge instructions consistently, but they really didn't appear to be engaged in the post-discharge plan of care, or they may lack the confidence to be able to carry out that plan of care. The health confidence tool reported that the health confidence score for our population was 6.5 out of 10, and the bare minimum that you wanted at is seven. So, you can see that there were some months that it was well below six and only a couple of months where it was over six. So what was the real root cause of our problems? <clears throat> and in talking with some of our patients after they did the survey and when we called them back afterwards, you know, to discuss, you know, got kind of a little focus group together and said, hey, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think is the big problem here? And the big problem turned out to be the ability to take that information and use it. So I'm going to play a video right now. I'm going to hope to God that it works. I've got everything optimized and I'm on my, my Wi-Fi. So let's pray really hard. <clears throat> this is from the American Medical Association. And if you've seen any one of my presentations before, you've probably seen this. Can you see that? Mm, maybe not. It just popped out. Creepy thing. Doug, can you see the video? I paid no electric bills last no, year. I can't see it. I can In hear fact, it. I was able to make money because I took advantage of this special program okay, that paid second. me to go solar. Let me. And I didn't have to pay it. Put a that on. And we'll do a new share. <gasps> That's so smart. I'm so good at this sometimes. I scare myself. All right. New share. Share sound. Share clip. Yes, me. All right. Ready? Dime out of pocket. It works. I, I was sick a lot. I was sick a lot because I probably missed dosage and didn't realize it. Um, I was in the hospital a lot. When they did give me medicine, I didn't take it right. I admit to it. I just didn't understand them and I didn't have the nerve to ask them the right way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the nerve to ask them and I didn't want anyone to know I couldn't read. I can't read this. Well, I guess the doctor gave it to me so it's okay for me to take it. When your children have fever, what do you usually give them? Uh, Motrin mm -hmm. or Tylenol. Normally Motrin because that's what my doctor recommended. How old is your daughter? She is four. Yes. She's four. Okay. Yes. I would um, 
give her the um, four to five, a, ta a tablespoon and a half. One caps, one caps of it. That's right. Um, one capsule. One caps that. I don't know what this is. That's twice. Yeah, tw twice. Twice daily. Okay. okay. So what? So how would you take this? When I see it, it's not on, I tell you how to take it. It say take it twice daily, but it don't say what time to take it. Do you uh, know what hypertension means, if I asked you what that was? Because when I look at this, I think, well, maybe you have hypertension, and I've been taking care of that for a long time. Hypered? Mm -hmm. Hypered. Like you're hyper? Mm -hmm. What does being hyper mean to you? That's, that's uh, where you can't be still. You always got to be doing something. Do, I, do you think I think you're hyper? And have uh, hypertension? Yeah, I don't know. I, that's what I consider it. Okay. It being, you know. Okay. But you know you have high blood pressure. Mm hmm Okay. But hypertension doesn't mean the same to you. Mm hmm So if I ask you if you have hypertension, you're going to just think I think you're jumping around on the chair or something like that, something different. Just being hyper, you know. Okay. All right. Well. I haven't done a very good job teaching you what hypertension is because I think you take that medicine for your <clears throat> hypertension and that's one of the things that I try to work with you on is your blood pressure. And high blood pressure and hypertension to us is the same the thing. The same thing. thing. Yeah. I have a small breakfast and then I take my pills. I usually take 16 every morning. Sometimes it's difficult to uh, for me to take these pills because if they say one tablet twice daily, um, I don't know if they're talking take one in the morning, one in the evening, or take one in the afternoon or one in the evening. So usually what I do is take two of them in the morning. Then this way I know I have them. If you have a reading problem, you go to the doctor. That can be very scary. It's like a nightmare. You walk in that office and um, most people, if you realize the first thing you're going to have to do if that's your first visit is fill out a form. Your heart beats real fast. You're scared. You don't know what to do. You want to turn around and walk out. I have. At approximately 30 or 31, I went into the gynecologist and complained about part of this not working correctly. And he said, we can repair that. Great. I didn't ask all the right questions. When I showed up two weeks later at the admissions office at the hospital, they put enough papers in front of me. I'll bet there were five papers that I needed to sign. Well, I wasn't going to say, excuse me, but I don't read really well, and I certainly don't read fast, and I'm concerned with some of these words. To me, it was lines and circles over sheets and sheets and sheets, and I wasn't going to reveal my sense of stupidity so I signed everywhere they told me to sign never read it and then a couple weeks later in the follow-up office visit the nurse said how are you feeling since your hysterectomy now I acted as normal as I could inside my mouth fell open and I thought to myself how could I be so stupid as to allow somebody to take part of my body, and I didn't know it. Please open your books to page 45. Did you know that only one third of all students entering high school are reading at grade level? All right, so what did we think about that? <clears throat> Hold on a second, I got issues. All right, let me go back to share screen. We'll go back to health literacy and we will share that. All right, so can you hear me all again? Yes. Cool, thank you, Doug. All right, so that was a pretty powerful video. If you really, I mean, every time I watch it, I take something else away. You know, the, the lady who, has 16 pills to take on a daily basis and she's not quite sure how to take the pills so instead of asking she just takes two of them in the morning and that way she's has them but that's not really how the medication is supposed to be taken right 
So if those are high blood pressure medications and she takes two of them, she's going to end up on the floor. If there are antibiotics, she's not getting the antibiotics on the, the schedule. So she's not always having the, the therapeutic dose of the antibiotics in her bloodstream to combat the infection that she's got. So lots of different considerations when we think about medication, but then also, you know, how are we empowering our patient in a shared decision-making model, especially uh, shown by that last lady who did not realize that she was having a hysterectomy at, at a very young age and, and were there any other options available to her? Okay, so <clears throat> AHRQ and CDC are big on health literacy. Nine out of 10 adults struggle to understand and use health information. It's unfamiliar to them, it's complex, and let's face it, as a healthcare system, we speak a different language than everybody else. When I was in nursing school, I actually had to take a full semester course on medical um, terminology. So we speak a different language and we need to make sure that our patients understand what we're trying to say in plain language. Limited health literacy costs the healthcare system money and higher than necessary morbidity and mortality. And you as a health literacy hero can improve health literacy with your patients by using plain language, by simplifying numbers and by accounting for culture as well. So health literacy is defined as a patient's ability to obtain, understand, and act on health information. It also speaks to a provider's capacity to communicate clearly, educate about health, and empower the family and the patient. And that really does go back to the CCMC Code of Professional Conduct. Principle two, we'll respect the rights and inherent dignity of all of our clients. If we're just throwing information at them that they can't use or they can't act on, we're not respecting their rights and, and their dignity to be able to manage their health. Why? Why do we have these problems? Well, we talked about that a little earlier. We are relying on the written word for patient and family education, whether it's to be expedient, whether it's to check a box, you know, oh, well, we're a stroke certified place, so we have to make sure that they have all this stroke education. And what better way to prove that you're giving stroke education than having a nice little handout? You can click a box in your form that says, I gave this to them, and it uploads into the system to prove to the certifiers and the surveyors that, hey, they did it for this patient. Oh, they did it for this patient. So you're sending them home with paper and paper and paper. But have we asked our patients, one, can you read? And two, can you understand what's on this piece of paper? And let's talk about it and let's have a conversation about what you need to look out for. We are an increasingly more complex healthcare system. Patients are living longer. They're going home on more and more medications. They're having more and more tests and procedure. And yet we are continuing to increase the emphasis on them being able to take care of themselves at home. Where we're discharging them, you know, while they're still kind of in that convalescent stage, we're discharging them home. Okay, you're going to take this, 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 and this, and we're expecting them to be able to manage it with a very short period of time to be uh, of, of education and teaching. <clears throat> Who's at risk for health literacy? Well, who isn't? Uh, most, most affected populations include the elderly, ethnic and racial minorities, people with limited English comprehension and communication skills, people of a low socioeconomic status, and people with chronic disease. And the more chronic diseases you add to that mix, the higher the health literacy risk is. Statement from the AMA says that poor health literacy is a stronger predictor of a person's health than age, income, employment status, education level, and race. So, 36% of the population functions at a basic or below basic literacy skills. So that's just the ability to read, okay? Most Americans read at an eighth grade level, but health education materials really should be written at a lower level. A lot of places prefer fifth to sixth, but really it's ideal to be at a third to fifth grade level. And only 12% of Americans have proficient health literacy, and most of them are in the healthcare profession. Some of the red flags that you can, you've probably seen in your patients when you're talking to them about, you know, discharging and getting ready to take care of themselves at home or why they came back to the hospital. 
they're making excuses. <clears throat> there may be some perceived resistance. Oh, you know, have you ever had a patient who was like, I don't feel ready to go home yet? That might be the reason. They're not ready because they don't feel confident to be able to go and take care of themselves at home. <clears throat> or conversely, they have absolutely no questions whatsoever for you because they don't want to let you know that they don't understand. The forms are incomplete. They're unable to name the medications or how to take them. They refer to them as the purple pill or the water pill or, you know, how, how do you take these? Well, um, how it says on the label. You got patients using the emergency room for primary care instead of a physician's office. They're not connected. And then you have readmissions for missed appointments and missed medications as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So some of the, <coughs> hold on one second. <clears throat> Some of the strategies that have been developed include, like I showed you in the, uh, in the first presentation, AHRQ has what's called Health Literacy Universal Precautions. And it, they said that since only 12% of Americans have proficient health literacy, we need to develop a standard, just like standard precautions, washing your hands, using gloves, et cetera, et cetera. Health literacy now has universal precautions that we use with all patients plain language, using teach back, and providing easy to read materials in the patient's preferred language, and communications using certified medical interpreters. Now, <clears throat> they can be expensive, but it's worth it, rather than using the patient's family member who may or may not give the patient verbatim what we're telling them, or there could be perceived resistance from the patient's end because the patient does not want the family member to know all their business. Also, um, using other staff in the hospital just because they speak the same language, they're not certified medical interpreters. You might get the interpretation incorrect if you're using somebody from, say, um, transportation, environmental, security, just, just because they speak that person's language. There's no guarantee that it's going to be communicated to your patient the way it needs to be communicated, which is why using certified medical interpreters is so important. These are people who have been who have been specifically trained in how to do this. And it's also a part of our CCMC code of professional conduct. We're our patients receive the highest highest. <clears throat> excuse me, <sighs> highest quality of service. And my speaker is flipping back and forth. Give me five seconds, guys. Sorry about that. Let's go out. Let's go back in. There we go. All right. Can you hear me okay? He'll hear you fine. Oh, good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Just making sure that. All right. Excellent. Something went a little wonky on this end. It was weird. All right. So case study number three is a 70 year old female retired nurse. Yes, this is my mother. And yes, this is a story that I have her permission to tell. Okay. She is ultra connected with the healthcare system, as you can imagine. Even after she retired, <clears throat> she decided to, you know, volunteer and do all this other stuff until she found herself, you know, in another state. <clears throat> and, you know, she saw her physician every month. She saw her PCP every month. Mom had multiple comorbidities. She had Crohn's. She had Graves disease. She had... Um, Oh, she had a couple of other things too. So multiple comorbidities. And you would, you know, we're assuming now, right? She's a nurse. She can handle this, right? So she has an initial hospitalization for the, for the Crohn's disease that sets off this horrible cascade. She's now losing weight. She lost 10 pounds the first month. She's excited. Hey, I lost 10 pounds. She's actually calling me on the phone going, hey, I lost 10 pounds. Hey, I lost 20 pounds. By the end of by the end of this cascade, she'd lost 50 pounds. Mom was four foot, 10 inches tall and 140 pounds to begin with. And yes, she probably could have standed to lose a little bit of the weight, but not 50 pounds worth of it. <clears throat> During that period of time, she'd also had two readmissions. And like I said earlier, several rehab attempts. We had a deteriorating condition. We had 
a lot of issues going on where, and just to backtrack a little bit. All right. So she's a retired ICU nurse for 38 years. She's familiar with computers. She's really good with computers. She's so good with computers that after her long-term partner died, um, she mourned for a couple of years. And then she got on silversingles.com and found herself a new husband and moved to Missouri. She's always on Facebook. She was always calling people on her phone. Technology did not frighten her in the slightest bit. She was so engaged with it, it wasn't even funny. So you got a deteriorating condition, not only the weight loss, but you, this lady who literally went and found herself a new husband on a, on a website could no longer figure out how to dial her phone. So we have a deteriorating condition. She's communicating all of this information to the PCP and the PCP's perception was, you know, okay, we'll get you a neuro consult. She gave her a referral for the neuro consult. It sat in the bottom of my mom's purse because mom didn't know how to dial her phone anymore. And when I finally put two and two together because mom was hiding things from me and went out to Missouri and went out to a doctor's appointment with her and pointed out, I'll tell you all about this doctor's appointment. Walk into this physician's appointment and the night before I had done a medication reconciliation at my mom's house. Oh, she also has chronic DVTs too. So she's taking all, you know, Coumadin, blood thinners, like the whole nine yards. So we've got probably about 20 different kinds of pills that mom keeps in a cute little bin from the dollar store. It's bright orange. You can't miss it. So I'm looking at this and I'm going through all these things. There's lots of duplicate medications in there because they get 90 day supplies and it comes in like two or three different bottles. There's one bottle for the Synthroid that she has to take for her Graves disease. And it's, it's a 90 day supply. And it says that it was refilled in September. And I opened it up and I looked at it and it looked pretty full. So I poured it out and I counted it. There were 90 pills in there. This is December. This was filled in September. Okay. Um, she's, she'd been in the hospital, like I said, several times for the Crohn's disease. So she was put on a regimen of steroids after she had been discharged from the hospital twice. So steroids, okay? We got steroids, we got the Synthroid, we got the DVT med. I think she was off of Coumadin at that point and on to Xeralto. Um, then she's got other medications too. So just, just big gigantic thing. I was really concerned about her not taking the Synthroid. She, when I asked her about it, said her doctor had told her to stop taking it back in September. So she hadn't taken it anymore. That was a red flag to me. And if she had been the patty that I and everybody else knew, it would have been a red flag to her as well. But she wasn't that person anymore. So went in for this doctor's appointment with her. Medical assistant comes in. They've got this big, gigantic, like big screen TV on the wall, but it's actually a touch screen. And the medical assistant is doing a medication reconciliation using all the meds that, you know, supposed to be using all the meds that my mom has on the table and the, the list up there. And she's looking at, she matches the bottle up with what's on the screen and she hits taking. She doesn't ask my mom. She doesn't ask me if mom is still taking the medication just by virtue of the fact that it's in that box. She assumes that mom is taking the medication, taking, 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 gets down to the Synthroid, hits taking. I had enough. I pulled the bottle out of her hand. I opened it up. I spilled 90 pills on that on the counter. And I said, what about this makes you think she's taking that medication? And she's like, I said, you're out of here. Get the doctor. Doctor comes in, looks at the, looks at the counter and says, what's all this about? I said, well, you've got a very interesting charting system up here. And your medical assistant's doing a medication reconciliation and says that my mother is taking the Synthroid. And I looked at my mother and I said, are you taking the Synthroid? She goes, no, I'm not taking the Synthroid. My doctor told me not to take the Synthroid back in September. And the doctor looked at me, looked at my mother, looked at the pile of pills and said, oh no. And I said, oh no, what? And she looked at my mom, she goes, Patty, I told you to stop taking the steroid, not the Synthroid. But then looking at the, at the computer screen, I see the doctor's documentation where mom is complaining about weight loss. Mom is complaining about weight loss, 10 pounds, 20 pounds. Oh, she's having confusion that she's reporting, but there's nothing being done about it and nothing being 
documented about and no, no, nothing. She, she got the neuro recommendation or the referral in November of the, the meeting just before the one I went out for. But she'd been complaining about confusion, according to the documentation for over three months. Wasn't saying anything to me, but because the doctor wasn't concerned, she wasn't going to. PCP's perception, when I looked at her and I said, let's look at your documentation, blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, what, what's going on here? And she says to me, well, Patty's a nurse. I thought she knew what to do. No, Patty's not a nurse in your office. Patty is a patient. And she did not assess my, her patient for being able to take care of herself or being able to understand what was being done because they just went along doing their thing up oh, the medications here she must be taking it as you can assume i was quite upset so that's my mom's story and that's why i get really really passionate about health literacy because the new hit standard for C for cmsa standards of practice says you know we've got to assess our patients for health literacy and, and elect especially for electronic literacy, but every time we interface with them, because guess what? Something can happen overnight. I've actually hired people and they, they interview phenomenally. They, they have a two or three weeks between the time that they're hired and the time that they come in. And I had one lady actually have a stroke that she didn't know about between the time that she was hired and the time that she came in for training. And she was realized that she couldn't do the job. And went to the doctor and said, oh, my goodness, uh, looks like you had a stroke, but nobody had caught it on her. So what am I supposed to do with all of this stuff, right? So I was at this conference and I met the guy, Dr. Eric Coleman, one of my rock stars. He's on my Mount Rushmore. Um, and he was talking about health confidence and he was talking about a program that he had seen done at two hospitals, uh, one in Mississippi and one in Ohio on an outpatient basis. So this was my aha moment. Um, he says that engaged patients have better health outcomes and better healthcare experiences and are less like, or likely to use fewer healthcare services and cost the healthcare system less in case dollars. So you've got a patient like my mom who is overly engaged in her healthcare, right? She goes and sees her doctor every month. She goes, you know, they have conversations, but it's still not meeting the needs, right? But then you've got other patients who don't think that they need to go to, for their follow-up appointment after hospitalization because, quote, I've seen so many doctors in the hospital, why do I have to see another one? So we have to get our patients engaged and activated, and we have to stay engaged and activated with them as well. So I had the opportunity to go and actually meet Dr. Coleman at this conference. It was a total fangirl moment. I embarrassed myself horribly, but it was so cool. And I, I think I still do have the picture somewhere around here. Anyway, the idea really began at that conference of what can we do with all this information that we gathered doing this survey of our patients, finding out that our patients were being sent home with packets of paper that they couldn't understand and information that they couldn't work. How do we bridge that gap for our patients? So Dr. Coleman talked to me about these two um, projects, one in Miss rural Mississippi and one in rural Ohio, where they had... And I called and, and spoke to both of the directors of these programs there. After the patient's discharge, about a week and a half after, they bring the patients back into the hospital system and they have a, a little meet and greet with them and they go over all the, dis the discharge instructions and fill any gaps, et cetera, et cetera. That was great, fine, and wonderful. I thought it was an enormously awesome idea. So here's my thing. I'm in metropolitan Chicago the chances of our patients coming back in to do an outpatient intervention when they're not showing up for their PCP visit 55% of the time is probably gonna be slim to none. So what I wanted to do was figure out how we could do this kind of an intervention on the inpatient side of the world and incorporate it into the patient's care, or care stay. So I did a literature search and I identified my stakeholders and my, my I team. So I found my key stakeholders. I convinced them to show up. How did I convince them to show up? I bought them food. I paid for lunch. I'm shameless. I did it. If you feed them, they will come. 
And then I found my physician champion. And while he's not the rock, Scott Levin is still a, a, a title belt holder for me in this case. Um, really, really great guy. He was our physician advisor for case management and went to the mat for us, especially with the physicians and the residents. Um, and my CEO was just incredible. I came to him with the idea. He looked at me and said, why not? And God bless him for that, because that why not really helped a lot. We did a literature search. We had our keywords of CHF, congestive heart failure. We we're going to focus on those two because those were our big ones. All those other keywords, we limited it to between 2009 and 2019. There were over 1,200 articles at that point in time, and there's more now. So um, team, look, at it. It's, it takes a village to do this, right? There's me, there's Dr. Levin, um, our chief nursing officer, Ellen Walker, my social work manager, par excellence, one of my two Ellens in my social work world. Dr. Megan Bisping, who is was the director of rehab services, uh, Ann Montgomery, pharmacy, Sylvia Williams, director of patient care services, Gwen Watkins, Dr. Gwen Watkins, nursing education, Mary Jo Soklis was in charge of outpatient services. And we had Susan Dolly from respiratory therapy. Kim Fisher and Samantha Heisch were our transition coaches. They were the ones who were actually on the phone with the patients who had CHF, COPD, et cetera, working with them you know, through a telephonic, almost a PAC program. And then Ron Fieldman from our community, from Total Home Medical Equipment, stepped up in a big way, big way. Great to have a community partner like that. So we created our intervention. We got our proposal together. We team input all over the place. We defined our roles in our education. We came up with our format. And then we came up with how we were going to identify our patients. So our proposal was, hey, we're doing all this research and everything keeps coming up to, you know, patients need an, a hands-on experience. And we know that simulation Sim labs, every one of us has probably gone through a sim lab at some point in time in their career, is a useful means of teaching those psychomotor skills in a very controlled laboratory environment prior to patient contact. That way we don't kill anybody when we're learning, right? So why wouldn't a simulation experience be an option for our patients? This could be a very valid strategy to be able to sit down with our patients, walk them through the, the steps of taking care of themselves, and, and provide them with some FaceTime one-on-one -on -one with people that they normally probably wouldn't have a lot of time with during their stay. So our proposal was to implement a program of multidisciplinary education during the patient's hospitalization that we would open up to both the patient and their selected caregiver. The interventions that we proposed included education on the chronic condition that they had, a review of their medications, how to manage some of the equipment that they'd be going home with, um, review of strategies to control some symptoms, how to conserve energy, review or schedule follow-up appointments, do some more gap finding for their discharge plan just prior to them going, and then providing a point of contact for patient and family questions as well. So we did a SWOT analysis. We found our internal forces, our external forces, the strengths, the opportunities, our weaknesses, and our threats. So strengths, we had strong organizational support, both local and corporate. So it was a for-profit hospital. It had great local support, both from our physician advisor and from our CEO. But also when we presented it to our corporate, they were like, yeah, this could be game-changing. It's evidence-based um, and it does focus on our current needs to reduce readmissions. The opportunities, decreasing organizational financial risk, it spoke to our value-based reimbursement opportunities. It has the potential to improve our star ratings. It has the potential to improve physician satisfaction as well because physicians were feeling like their patients weren't getting much in the way of education. And then it would help us to become the hospital of choice for CHF and COPD care. The weaknesses, resources, staffing capabilities. We were all having issues in our departments with you know, bringing people on and staying fully staffed but also patient buy-in and engagement. Some of our issues were, and you'll see during the evaluation period, just getting the patients to say, yeah, I'll give it a try was, was a trial. 
um, threats, existing culture resistance to change. This hospital has been in existence for 118 years. And I swear there are some people who've been there from the day that it opened. And this is the way that we've always done things. And this is the way we're always going to do things, kind of a mentality. Um, electronic medical record insufficiencies at that time, we were on a version of Horizon that had been sunsetted for about two years. And there was nothing that we could do to actually write new reports and therefore identification of CHF and COPD patients was going to be very labor intensive and manual. So again, patient identification. How are we gonna find our patients? We can't run reports, we can't put in alerts. So it really came down to running the census every day and identifying our patients. So we used our daily census and the transition coach risk tool, um, either myself or whoever I decided to torture with that day um, was primarily responsible for identifying that population. Additionally, if the case manager, nurse or social worker was um, visiting with a patient and they had you know, CHF as a, not necessarily the primary reason that they were in the hospital, but they felt that they really could, could use the, the intervention, then by all means, we included them in that. But also in a referral from the, the nurse taking care of the patient or from the physician who's caring for the patient as well. Our patients were identified on our unit tempo board using this I can't magnet that we made, um, taking the I can't and making it into an I can. Um, they are then approached by the transition coaches to be able, you know, for their consent to participate in the Health Confidence Lab experience. Um, we also worked with our patients assigned nurses to say, hey, you know, this is part of the plan of care or talking about patient education. We also really leaned on our physicians to say, hey, you know what, can you make this like a doctor's order so that we go in and we talk to the patient and say your doctor really wanted this. And then potential participants were provided with a one page information sheet about the lab experience that is reviewed with them. We don't assume that they can read. We go over it with them prior to that and get their get their approval to participate. All right, so now we got everything together. What was the hardest part about this was finding the room for it in the hospital. And that was our biggest challenge. Um, everybody agreed with, you know, the roles and what education was going to be provided. And that came together rather quickly. But finding a space big enough to accommodate our intervention was a big problem, so much so that, you know, we did two or three meetings be, you know, just going back and forth with somebody telling us, you know, nope, we can't do it. Nope, we can't do it. So I invited the CEO to the meeting and I said, this is the problem that we're having. I need you to show up and, and put some muscle to this. And so he showed up, he listened to the back and the forth and the back and the forth. And he looked at, at the person that was in charge of assigning space in the hospital. He goes, I don't care where you find it, find it. And within a week we had the space. So leverage your, leverage your C guys as much as you need to. So you're asking yourself, well, what did you need all this space for? Well, remember this was pre-COVID, okay? So if anybody out there is as old as me and remembers curves, it's a, it's a uh, what do they call it? A station training kind of a, you go in and you go from one station to another and you spend five to 10 minutes at each station and you're supposed to come out of it afterwards and go, oh, I have a total body workout. So we decided to create a circuit training program for our patients to do health education. It allows for one-on-one -on -one interaction with our healthcare professionals. We're using multiple teaching and learning strategies. Some of them occurred in their room, you know, where they had to access the patient education channel and watch a video or, you know, and then they'd come down. Um, this was really to help assist them in acquiring and or reinforcing skills that they need to successfully self-manage their conditions post-discharge, really making sure that they understood what was expected of them, giving them the tools to be confident about taking care of themselves at home and decreasing the anxiety of being discharged. So for best results, this health confidence lab experience occurs as close to the day prior to discharge as possible, and it brings all of the patient teaching together. So, you know, we're hoping that patient teaching is being done all along the time that the patient is in the hospital. Our transition coaches are meeting with the patient, the nurses, pharmacies making their rounds, the doctors are in there talking. We want to really just bring it all together, tied up with a nice little bow with a whole bunch of different types of learning opportunities rather than just paper and talking.
So we have visual, we had video, we had tactile learning opportunities. And the patient's family or caregivers are also encouraged to attend, whether they attended with their patient or they came on their own, we would take them in either way. The Health Confidence Lab was open daily, Monday through Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And then when the patients get there or the participant, we'll say it could be patient or could be caregiver, we gave them a pretest and an initial health confidence survey tool. And so they completed this 10, uh, 10 question pretest about how, to, how they would be managing their, their condition at home, asked them how confident they were about taking care of themselves at home, got that back. Then they received what we call the lab station checklist and feedback form. Again, I'm big on checklists, right? It's green, it's bright green, it was perfect. Um, patient identification sticker was put on the top of it. And that became actually part of the chart because we use it as a communication tool back and forth with the, uh, the physicians that weren't able to attend, you know, and be there. So they can start their health confidence lab experience at any station, but they have to visit all stations before they check out of the lab. And when they finish their last, um, station, they then complete the post-test and the post-experience health confidence survey to determine, did this educational experience have impact in preparing them for self-management? So it's the exact same thing that they got on the front end. They're doing it on the back end. All right. And this is what they look like. So this is the COPD one. I understand what to watch for when I'm not feeling well. I know how to respond when my health is getting worse. I understand what each of my medications is for. I know when, how much, and how often I should take my medications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the health confidence tool is exactly what Dr. Coleman has published out there. How confident are you that you can control and manage most of your healthcare problems? Okay. This is our... If you imagine this on bright lime green paper, this was our checklist. So at station number one, they went over signs and symptoms, and those are the activities that they did. Medication reconciliation, DME, respiratory therapy, physical therapy, and then met with our social work manager to go back over the follow-up appointments, paperwork um, completed, and resources and services that were available to them. Okay. So what did we talk about at all these stations? So at our first station was signs and symptoms. So this was our master's prepared transition coaches. They went over the stoplight tool from either the American Lung Association or the American Heart Association, basically who to call, when to call them. They went back over the education packet that they'd been working with the patients the, the, the whole time that they'd been in the hospital. And we had videos for them to watch about managing their specific chronic condition. Okay. After that, they go to the medication reconciliation station where a pharmacist or a pharmacy student is sitting there at a computer and they're doing a live medication management interaction with them, teaching them about the different inhalers, showing them how to use them. You'd be surprised how many people don't know how to use their inhalers, right? Um, and having conversations about managing their medications and identifying medications that may or may not be on their formulary and on, the, on that green form, they're making a note of that because that's going back to the physician to say, hey, you know what, if we don't get an opportunity to connect, this is out of formulary, you need to provide a different one. Then we had the DME station. This was uh, provided by our friends at Total Home Medical Equipment. They gave us a nebulizer. They gave us a portable oxygen uh, tank. They gave us a home oxygen concentrator, a CPAP, a BiPAP, try, you know, trials so that our patients could get hands-on experience with unfamiliar equipment. Imagine you're going home on oxygen for the first time and you get home and this thing that looks like a less friendly version of R2-D2 shows up in your living room. And you're like, that's really intimidating and kind of scary looking. And I don't want to be hooked up to that for the rest of my life. However, when they got to the, the sim lab, they were able to see that they were able to figure out, you know, Where's the plug? Where's the buttons? Where's the on off switch, et cetera, et cetera. And they were, they got a little bit more comfortable with it. And that was actually something that they really came back to us and said, that really helped us out a lot. We talked about use and cleaning of nebulizers. You would not be, you would not believe how many people don't realize that you're supposed to actually take it apart and clean it and put it back together. And, you know, we would be like, no wonder you're in the hospital with pneumonia. Okay, here you go. 
Um, then we talked about protecting your lungs and identifying triggers. Respiratory therapy was had a table there. They identified triggers. They made recommendations for lifestyle changes that they'd been making the entire time, but really reinforcing that. Um, and then everybody left with an acapella valve to be able to help move their, their uh, air expansion in their lungs. Physical therapy talked about endurance and, and exertion and how to conserve energy. We did stair trainings and assessments right there in the lab with their little miniature stairs, especially for patients going home for the very first time with portable oxygen that were like dragging it behind them and the little wheelie thing. How do you get up and down stairs with that? And do you really want to send somebody home without really testing that? So that's what we did there. And then they met with either a case manager or a social worker, talked about goals of care, you know, put, you know some ideas of you know, what they wanted to do with end of life care, especially with their paperwork management. Trying to get powers of attorney for healthcare and surrogate decision makers for our patients was a real trial before we started this intervention. And we had 60% completion of powers of attorney for healthcare and surrogate decision makers um, for everybody that came through our sim lab. It was pretty incredible where on the floor, it was like a 10%. We also made sure that they had a post-acute um, follow-up visit scheduled. We reinforced why that was important. And we made sure that they were connected with the post-acute resources, gave them all the contact information, made sure that they knew, you know, if, if this home health agency does not show up, here's the number that you call for them, but then please give us a call back and made sure that they understood all the services that were set up for them so that they could be prepared, you know, when, when all this stuff was gonna happen. So you may say, okay, great. What were your results? So here's our results. Pre and post test. Um, the blue is the pre test and the yellow is the post test. So when they were coming in, they scored themselves a little lower. And when they were leaving, they went, wow, we're actually more able to understand what's going on with ourselves. You will notice that month five is sadly very empty. And it's sadly very empty because during month five, we all, every unit in that hospital had acute staffing issues and we just could not staff the sim lab that month. The health confidence score. So coming in, how confident did our people feel that they were able to take care of themselves? And when they were leaving, how much more prepared did they feel? So the blue is before the intervention and the yellow is after the intervention. Readmission impact. All right, so we start off in January, we're at about 11%. We pop up to about seven, 16% in February, March down, April zero. May, we were off because we had no staff. June, zero. July popped up to about 8% again, and then August back up to 18%. So you can see that the intervention actually did have some impact on our readmission rate, especially between February and let's say June, July. All right, so our total population for our CHF and COPD primary diagnosis patients, we had a total population during the, that pilot time of 323 patients. Out of that 323 patients, we had 58 readmissions. So we had 20.5% of our population for CHF and COPD were readmitted to our hospital. We had 130 of that 323 or 37.15% of our population actually participated in the sim lab experience. Out of those 130, we only had 14 readmissions for a 10.12% readmission rate of the population who participated in the sim lab. Not too shabby. More importantly though, was the patient feedback was incredible. It was so cool. Gave me good information and did not talk down to me. What does that tell you about that person's previous experience in the healthcare community? So many people cared to take the time to do this. I've been to a lot of hospitals and this experience was impressive. I didn't know something like this even existed. Well, it didn't, but now it does. I wasn't sure at first, but I thought it would be a waste of time. It sure was not a waste of time. So here's the story behind that one. This gentleman had been readmitted three times. And every time we'd gone in there and said, hey, we've got this thing, we'd love to love to have you there. No, 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 I know how to take care of myself. I know how to take care of myself and would refuse flat out. The, th the third readmission, I went in there, I said, look, you've been readmitted three times now. And you keep telling me that you know how to take care of yourself. It's obvious that we're not preparing you. 
as well as we should be to be able to take care of yourself. I would really appreciate it if you would come to this and tell us, you know, just give us some feedback so we know if we're on the right track. So he came and he was like, wow, I should have done this weeks ago. And of course, I went back to my office and went like, yes. So um, another patient said, I like talking with everyone, got more information than I ever have. I liked it. It provided an opportunity for questions and options for increased lifestyle. So we had conversations, you know, well, I want to do this. Oh, well, I want to do that. And she said that she understood everything much better than before. I got more knowledge and more understanding of my illness. And I loved the personal one-on-one -on -one experience. Well, who doesn't love one-on-one -on -one experiences, right? And this was seriously one-on-one -on -one time with, with disciplines that she probably would not have had an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one with. When's the last time somebody from pharmacy stopped in a room and had a 15-minute conversation and went over your medications in real time? Some hospitals have that program. Most don't. Our challenges. Oh, and trust me. We were not without our challenges. IT, of course, we talked about that a little bit ago with like the antiquated um, uh, EMR. Transportation was a huge issue, but here's, here's a creative solution. PT said, we've got a list every day of who's gonna be going to the sim lab. What we're gonna do is we're gonna change around our treatment times and the person that we're going to treat just before two o'clock is gonna be somebody who's going to the sim lab. So we're just gonna whip them down there. <laughs> It worked so well, and SimLab was able to start on time, and then we could just activate transportation for the people coming down after. Uh, participation percentage, like I said, 37% of our patients participated. Really getting them engaged in that would have been, you know, just such a, a phenomenal, if we could have gotten 60%, that, that readmission rate would have dropped even further. Getting our physicians engaged. At first, they weren't quite sure what we were doing. Dr. Levin did uh, some great seminars with the residents about it, but you know, talking and 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 seeing are two different things. So we actually, after a couple of months, we did a sim lab simulation for the residents, and one of our social workers played patient, and all the sim lab participants did their thing, while a group of residents were watching. And they walked away out of there and they went, this is incredible. And then they started making referrals for everybody under the sun to come to the sim lab. And it's like, whoa, 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 that's not for this. We have, you know, we, we have only these couple of diagnoses, but we're, you know, we wanted to expand it out there. So definitely and we would take that into consideration. And then same thing for staff nurse engagement. They're like, okay, what, what is this whole new thing? So we brought them down and did a sim of that as well. And they, and after that, that's when they started really hyping it up to the patients and saying, you know, this is part of our patient education program, blah, 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 blah. Um, our next steps, we wanted to incorporate some tablets for on-demand patient education videos. Uh, how are we going to do that? We were working with our in-house production team and educate and engage more physicians to engage the patients. And then, of course, we wanted to expand it to new diagnoses. But then you know what happened, right? Yeah, COVID. Boo. So this was our open house for our Health Confidence Lab that we sent out to all of our friends in the medical services. And then our expansion plans were to go to our BPCIA diagnoses. We have a very large end stage renal population at that hospital. So um, that was gonna be our next really focused targeted group. And then we were also launching a new ortho program. So uh, making sure that we had the TKAs and the THAs had their own uh, time in the lab was gonna be important as well. So I might be, I might be wrapping up a little early here. Um, the current state of discharge planning and discharge uh, teaching is, let's face it, very archaic and ineffective. And I'm going to tell you why I, th why I feel this way with the story right after I get done with this slide. Um, we needed to create an interactive experience to engage our patients and their caregivers. Interestingly enough, we did have several caregivers that, that attended with their patients, but we also had several caregivers make appointments to come in on their own even after their patient had been discharged because they wanted a refresher, which I thought was incredible. It is truly an interdisciplinary team collaboration. I am all about collaborations. I do not pretend to know everything, but I can find out a lot. Um, but I'm not a physical therapist. I'm not a respiratory therapist. I'm not a pharmacist. I'm not a physician. I'm not a social worker, that's for sure. So 
pulling all of that team together. And then the other team that supported us like transport and um, the, the person who found us space and, you know, housekeeping to go in and clean that space every day and do a, do literally a terminal clean on that space every day while we were cleaning in between patients was really important. So it really, it took a huge village to create this and to maintain it. But at the end of the day, what it was all about was doing the right thing at the right time for our patients and empowering them to be able to take care of themselves and stay in the in the area that they wanted to be in, which was home, and to be able to manage their, their own care and improve the quality of their life as well. So to that end, I think that this project hit pretty much on all the cylinders of the CCMC Code of Professional Conduct, where we placed the public interest above our own, where we respected the rights and inherent dignity of our clients, where we maintained objectivity in our relationships with our clients, that we acted with integrity and fidelity to make sure our clients got everything that they needed. And we're maintaining our competency at a level that makes sure that our clients received the highest level of quality of service. So telling you a real quick story, this has always been in the back of my head. And it's, it's like one of the reasons that readmissions has been such a driving force in my career. My very first hospital that I came uh, to work at after I did a stint at in managed care, hold on, it was right around the time that readmissions was really being buzzed about, about 2009. So um, we were trying to do, we were, we we're implementing Project Red, we we're trying to do a couple of other things, trying to make sure that this, you know, this readmissions thing got nipped in the bud. And we had a patient who was readmitted six times in four weeks, which sounds almost impossible, but it's not. And he would not play nice in the sandbox with anybody that went in there. The, the straw that broke the camel's back was when one of my per diem case managers, who was a retired case manager who was coming back to work, you know, just occasionally to help us out with staffing. She went in to talk to him and he MF'd her out of the room. And Andrea was like, I don't take that from my children. I don't take that from my husband. I don't take that from nobody. And I was like, you're right. So I said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out what's going on here. I had a huge desk calendar and I went into the medical record and I crossed off on, the, on my desk calendar, all the days that he had been in the hospital for the past month in red. So it stood out. And I really, I noticed a pattern, which was very interesting to me that he was always in the hospital during the week, but not on the weekends. So I went up to his room, I had some tape. I put it on the back of the calendar, walked in, stuck it to the wall, turned around, introduced myself and said, hi, my name is. And I noticed that you're in the hospital quite frequently and I'd like to find out what's going on. And he said to me, you're wrong. I'm not in the hospital. I was like, well, that's directly out of the medical record. So it's not lying. And so I said, there's, there's a, a significant pattern of behavior here. And he, so further conversation and stuff like that. Once he realized that I wasn't being judgmental and I was really you know, open to wanting to hear his side of it. And uh, he said, well, you know, I'm out of work. I said, okay, you're out of work. And, uh, you know, all my friends are still working. The only socialization I really get is, you know, going to the bar on the weekends for college football. You know, I think if, if high school football was televised, he'd have been there for that too. But, you know, college football on Friday and Saturday night, and then NFL on Monday or Sunday and Monday. And usually he would be admitted late Monday night, early Tuesday morning. So, okay, great, fine, wonderful. Um, so what is this meaning? Well, you know, I'm at the bar. Okay, you're drinking a lot of beer. You're eating those salty snacks that I referenced way long time ago, right? I said, have you talked to your doctor about this? Well, I go to my doctor and all he says is I got to stop doing this and I got to stop doing that. He goes, but you know, there's got to be another way to do this so that, you know, I don't have to give up everything that I love. And I was like, okay, well, we can try to coordinate that. I said, is there anything else that you need? And he goes, I'd really like to get back to work. I said, okay, what kind of work do you do? He says, well, I'm an over the road trucker. And I said, oh, okay. I said, so what's keeping you from doing that? He goes, I need a hip replacement. He needs a hip replacement because he can't drive because he's being shaken like this and he's in a lot of pain. If you've ever been in the cab of a 18 wheeler, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
he can't get cardiac clearance for the surgery because he's in the hospital with CHF all the time. So the gods were smiling upon me that day. His physician was actually, his PCP was actually in the nurse's station. I went out there, I went out there and I got him. And on the way back to the, the patient's room, I gave him the, the down low on what was going on here. And I said, we need to be focused on what the patient wants, not what best practice is, not what, you know, standards of care says, but we need to figure out a way for this guy to get from point A to point B without giving up everything that he loves in life. Is there a way that we could do this? So they sat down and they had a conversation. I was there to mediate it. And at the end of the day, he said, I'll make you a deal. If you cut down your beer consumption by this and don't eat any of the salty snacks at the bar, because he explained salt and the liquid don't go together. And that's why you're in the hospital. <laughs> so having this conversation with him, he said, on the weekends, I'll give you an extra dose of Lasix to take so that we don't have these problems. Great, fine, wonderful. The next time I saw this gentleman, he was coming to joint class. It was seven months later. We had a joint preparation class. And as he's, he comes in and you know, I go in, I do my little thing. I'm case management. This is what we do, blah, 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 blah. I stick around because I want to talk to this gentleman. And uh, he comes up to me afterwards. He's like, Miss Colleen. I was like, yes. He goes, I just want you to know, I haven't even been to the hospital across town either since, since you, you and me and the doctor sat down. I said, that is really great. I said, when is your surgery? He says, it's next week. And I said, congratulations to you. That's awesome. This was also the same gentleman who told me that one of the reasons that he kept getting readmitted was because he didn't have his medications. And I said, well, why don't you have your medications? He said, well, you know, the first time I went home, they sent me home with a packet of paper that was about this thick. He had 15 micromedics about all of his different medications. He had eight comorbidities and a micromedics on every one of his eight comorbidities. He had all of his discharge instructions, but somebody had failed to tell him that instead of the cute little pieces of paper that we used to use for prescriptions, we'd switched to eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that were pre-printed off of the computer. And so he was looking for the little tiny pieces of paper and he couldn't find them. So he just was like, oh, they didn't give me any prescriptions. And he got frustrated trying to look through everything, trying to find them all. So he noticed that he had a plant that was leaking on his table and he took the entire discharge packet and put the plant on top of it to soak up all the water. So all of his scripts were ruined. His follow-up appointments were ruined. All of the education that we had sent home with him was ruined. And he said every time that he was in the hospital, that happened time and time again. And he just had lost faith in finding out, you know, where are my prescriptions? So that's my story. That's why health literacy is so important to me. This is why we put something in place. And this is why I think that health literacy is actually the bedrock of where we need to start our conversations with our patients if we're looking to reduce readmissions. We can throw the entire healthcare system and the kitchen sink at this problem, but if we don't address the underlying problem that there is a patient there who does not know how to take care of this issue, this issue or this situation, and they're scared, they're frightened, this is new information to them, they're not feeling very powerful right now, they're feeling kind of more like a victim, and maybe we need to start there and address the, you know, address it in baby steps, education. Let's talk about how you're going to take care of yourself from here on. You're going to be taking care of yourself. These are some strategies for you to be able to do that and build upon that with the services, with the, the DME, with the other things that we're doing. But this is why our patients are not engaged because we're not taking the time to really empower them. My perspective, my opinion. And I will end at that moment in space. Um, I do have a full list of selected re uh, references available on request. There are over 100. This actually turned out to be about a 96 page paper. And if you want the references, I'd be more than happy to share them with you. Ta-da! Great. Thank you, Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, a couple of questions, and I think that you probably answered um, one of these. 
Um, Jenny asks, um, the PAC program, do you have a more detailed article to download in case we might want a trial model at our hospital? Ooh, um, yeah, actually, Jenny, the PAC program was published in CMSA Today magazine. Um, I'm not quite sure when. Let me look real quick. But um, dun, dun, dun. it was issue two, 2019. That one. Okay. Um, and I think you probably covered this. Jenny asked, what are you using to measure health literacy and health confidence? Um, health literacy, we're using a patient's perspective of, you know, how are they, there's really no health literacy, you know, okay, how health literate are you? Is it subjective? But health confidence, definitely Dr. Watson and Dr. Coleman's tool, it's, it's the gold standard in measuring health confidence. Anybody else have any other questions? Uh, Amy has said another great model for patient education and chronic disease self-management is the group visit model, which many primary care practices have been doing um, in her area. Visits can include patients and caregivers, the PCP specialist, nurse case manager, sometimes nutrition and social work, and they are um, billable. Opportunity cool. to engage with providers as well as hear other patients' experiences of course, time and willingness of providers and space can be a barrier. Amy, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. <laughs> Jean <laughs> says, my dogs serve to accentuate my points. They barked at all the right times. <laughs> oh my God, that's hysterical. Thank you so much for putting up with my, my herd of chihuahuas. I appreciate that. Um, and the reference slide that you showed is included in the um, slides that were right. sent but if, out. But if somebody wants the extended reference list, I'll be more than happy to send it to them. Just uh, you know, email um, Maureen and then um, ask her for my references and she'll forward that to me. Any other questions for Colleen? All right. Well, Colleen, thank you so much for two wonderful topics and for um, giving us your time and your expertise. Um, we're thrilled to have you talk to us and we look forward to seeing you in March Absolutely. here in Boston. Thank you so much. Oh, June. <laughs> You're <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Like I said earlier, when we were in, um, in our practice session, I have been wanting to speak for this group for the longest time. Thank you for the opportunity. I am honored to speak as just a presenter, but I am more honored to be your national president and to be able to help represent you and to be your advocate wherever, wherever you need me. So if you need me, reach out. I am, I am very, very reachable. <laughs> well, thank you for all of that.